Good morning, and welcome to this Quincy Institute webinar, The Perils of Sports Washing and Greenwashing for U.S. Foreign Policy. My name is Ben Freeman. I'm the director of the Democratizing Foreign Policy Program here at the Quincy Institute. And I'm honored today to serve as the moderator on this panel, which could not be more timely. Sports washing and greenwashing are all the rage. In just the past few years, we've seen a surge in authoritarian regimes turning to sports and climate change initiatives to launder their reputations and more general, generally, to spread their influence around the world. Authoritarian regimes are hosting major climate change conferences right now, for example. Petro states are trumpeting their minuscule green energy initiatives and sports have arguably become one of the top methods authoritarian regimes use to launder their reputations. In the US, we've seen Chinese influence impact the NBA. Soccer has been at the forefront of sports watching efforts from Qatar hosting the World Cup to Saudi Arabia's multi-billion dollar investment in its own star-studded league. And of course, the government of Saudi Arabia has attempted to effectively control the international game of golf via the proposed merger of the LIV, DP, and PGA tours. Now, some might argue these are just business investments, but there's compelling evidence that they're part of these governments' much larger influence operations. I personally spend far too much of my time analyzing Foreign Agents Registration Act filings, and more and more often, I'm seeing registered foreign agents working directly with these sports washing endeavors, which is why I believe sports washing and greenwashing are the next frontiers in the battle against malign foreign influence in the US. And frankly, we're losing that battle badly. But there's hope. That's precisely why we're here today, actually. That's why the Quincy Institute is hosting this event. And even more importantly, why we're ecstatic to be joined today by such an extraordinary group of panelists who've been working tirelessly to shine a bright light on the dark worlds of sports watching and green watching. First, we're joined by Sarah Lee Whitson, who's the Executive Director of Democracy for the Arab World Now, also known as DAWN. Previously, she served as Executive Director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Division from 2004 to 2020. She oversaw the work of the division in 19 countries with staff located in, in 10 of those. She's published widely on human rights and foreign policy in the Middle East and in international and regional media, including the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, the Los Angeles Times, you name it, uh, you've probably seen Sarah's words in, in that outlet. Next, we're joined by Sanjeev Berry. Sanjeev is the founder and executive director of Freedom Forward, a nonprofit organization that seeks a world in which all people have the benefit of living in societies that are anchored in democracy and respect for human rights. Previously, Berry served as advocacy director for the Middle East and North Africa program at Amnesty International USA where he lobbied U.S. officials, diplomats, and office holders regarding human rights concerns across the MENA region. Like Sarah, his commentaries on U.S. foreign policy and human rights have appeared in just about every major media outlet that you're familiar with. Last but certainly not least, we're honored to be joined by Joey Shea. Joey is a researcher in the Middle East and North Africa Division at Human Rights Watch, where she investigates human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Prior to joining Human Rights Watch, she was a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, focusing on digital information controls and operations, security, political violence, and the human rights impact of technology across the Middle East and North Africa. More recently, I'm, I'm proud to report that in September, Julie and I testified together at a hearing of the Senate's permanent subcommittee on investigations about the government of Saudi Arabia's sports washing efforts in the US. And perhaps even more critically to the focus of our event today, uh, Joey is uh, uh, coming to us from, uh, from the UAE, where she's attending the COP28 UN Climate Change Conference. Given this front row seat to greenwashing, we're going to turn to Joey for opening remarks first, and then look forward to hearing from Sarah and Sanjeev about their wonderful work as well. But viewers, please, please don't think we're leaving you out. We're hoping to get all of you involved as well in our Q&A session at the end. So you can find the Q&A button at the bottom. Please don't hesitate to put your questions in there and we'll hopefully be able to get to as many questions as we possibly can before our hour is up. With all that said, uh, Joey, we welcome your remarks. 
Thank you, Ben, for those opening remarks. And as well, thank you to the Quincy Institute for organizing this very important event uh, and very timely as well. As Ben mentioned, uh, I am coming to you from Dubai. I have spent the last seven days um, at Dubai Expo City where COP28 is being held. Today was actually a rest day in the COP process. And tomorrow we start the second week of COP um, and it will is expected to wrap up around December 12th, but may even at uh, the negotiation go beyond that. Um, so as Ben mentioned, I cover the UAE for Human Rights Watch and um, HRW over the past 10 years has been documenting the Emirati government's sustained assault on basic rights and freedoms in the country. The Emirati government has targeted human rights defenders, effectively criminalized basic freedoms like freedom of expression, freedom of assembly and freedom of association. Um, high profile human rights defenders have also been targeted and arrested, including Ahmed Mansour, who is a current member of Human Rights Watch's MENA's advisory committee. In March of 2017, Ahmed Mansour was arrested from his home and he has since been detained in an isolation cell without access to basic prisoner's rights, like even a mattress to sleep on for many years, without his reading glasses, nor access to reading materials. Um, the UAE has um, also in 2012, starting in 2012, engaged in a sustained assault on a number of lawyers, judges, um, public intellectuals in what became known as the UAE 94 case. Um, and this case has spanned a decade and many of these individuals um, who were sentenced after an unfair trial 10 years ago are in fact up for release. And yet the Emirati government is continues to detain them um, past their expected release date. So this was the broad context um, in which COP28 was happening. And over the last year, Human Rights Watch has been working um, with our civil society partners to um, try to shine a light, use COP28 to shine a light on the Emirati government's rights records um, in advance of COP28. Uh, unfortunately, that um, process was extremely difficult. We met with a number of governments in advance of COP, um, particularly in regard to the case of Ahmed Mansour, as well as the UAE 94 case. And we were not able, uh, not a single government that we met with issued a unilateral statement demanding Ahmed Mansour's immediate and unconditional release. I think that these lack of public statements about the human rights situation in the UAE and the need to release political prisoners is inextricably linked with the UAE's greenwashing efforts. Um, now, when we began this work nearly a year ago, um, we found that the UAE government is using COP28 as a means to burnish its image while continuing to push for the expansion of fossil fuels. Um, and unfortunately, that has been exactly the case. And we've been seeing this firsthand here at COP28. Um, a climate group recently released a report just two days ago, which found that COP28 has historic numbers of fossil fuel lobbyists in attendance. After only the Brazil and Emirati delegation, fossil fuel lobbyists accounts account for the largest numbers of delegates at COP28. Um, so there are approximately 2,456 fossil fuel lobbyists here at COP28. And that is enormous. That is more than the numbers that attended COP27 last year. So not only are we seeing the effectiveness of um, the Emirati's, Emirati government's uh, whitewashing, greenwashing strategy in the lack of public statements and, and attention being brought to the human rights situation, but we're also you know, seeing it in the number of fossil fuel lobbyists as well in attendance. Um, in terms of what's been happening on the ground here at the conference, um, as I said, um, over the past 10 years, the Emirati government has effectively criminalized basic freedoms. So protests, uh, freedom of expression are, are criminalized here. And it was a concern for many climate activist groups who are coming um, about what, what that would mean, given that uh, under the UNFCCC, civil society organizations um, have official observer status and civil society is such plays such an important role in climate negotiation. So many activists were concerned about how safe it was going to be to attend COP28, to come to Dubai, um, and you know what would happen when they did come and if they were you know, going to plan protests. So what we've seen here um, is that 
very small actions have been allowed in the blue zone of the UNFCCC. So this is the UN govern zone, which is govern, which is subject to UNFCCC rules and regulations. And these groups that have held these small actions, as they call them, have had to go through the regular UNFCCC approval process to get these actions approved. Now, um, there are you know, certain constraints on the types of actions and what is allowed, um, even if you do get them approved. Um, so for example, you're not allowed to name specific countries in the action, you have to keep it general. Um, but these guidelines exist throughout all COPs. So they were in place at COP27 in Egypt, at COP20 before that, so they're not specific to the context here um, in the UAE. But what is different than even last year in Sharm el Sheikh is the total complete closure of civic space outside of the blue zone. So the blue zone, you need a badge. Human Rights Watch um, has official observer status at the UNFCCC, so I am able to go within the special zone. Many civil society organizations that are smaller and have less capacity are not able to have observer status with the UNFCCC or, and are unable to access the blue zone. So outside of this blue zone, you have the green zone and beyond. Um, and these areas are subject to Emirati national law. Uh, and of course, under Emirati national law, protests are criminalized. It is not safe to protest. Um, the Emirati government and the UNFCCC came out with a joint statement in August this year, promising that there was going to be space for freedom of expression, assembly and association at COP28, and that it was going to be the most inclusive COP ever. We asked for clarification about as, as to what you know steps the UNFCCC was going to take to make sure that those rights were protected. We didn't um, hear back, unfortunately, um, but we have seen the implications here over the past week in that in the green zone, no protests have taken place, unsurprisingly. There was only one group that actually went through the pro official process to try to get an action, a protest approved in the green zone, and they um, were rejected. Um, they were not allowed to um, to hold that protest there. And, you know, this was not surprising to us. Um, we think that, you know, as human rights groups uh, ourselves in, in um, Amnesty International, as well as many others, um, did a lot of work with climate groups um, beforehand to, to warn of the risks. So it's not surprising that we didn't see other groups, you know, attempting to hold protests in the green zone because we effectively did our communication beforehand um, and, you know, said that these um, actions should only be limited to the blue zone. So that has been... Um, that's been the sort of dynamic over the last uh, seven days. There was a historic action that did take place on Sunday by climate activists showing solidarity with Gaza. Um, and this was, you know, just incredibly historic. There has not been a Palestine solidarity protest in the UAE since 2008. And unfortunately, it had to happen within the safe blue zone of the UNFCCC. And unfortunately, only international climate activists were able to attend. Um, and one concern that we have as Human Rights Watch is, you know, these small actions that are taking place may lead to the perception that there has been an opening in the UAE because of COP28, when in fact, that could not be farther from the truth. These actions are small, they're limited, they are within a very um, specific zone and subject to these special rules. And outside of COP28 on December 12th, when we expect the conference to end, it may go, negotiations may go beyond that it will not be allowed. Um, so that's been the reality here today. Um, other greenwashing um, efforts that we have documented, we recently came out with a report about air pollution in the UAE. Um, Dubai has historic levels of air pollution and the government says that um, these levels are often have to do with sandstorms, whereas we have found that there is a link with fossil fuel production um, in the UAE, that you know, this is significant, fossil fuel production significantly con contributes to poor air quality, um, which has clear health risks as well. Um, and yet, you know, the, the Emir Emirati government is, is simply unwilling to admit the role of fossil fuels in the poor air quality that we see here in the UAE. Um, so yeah, I will, I will stop there and I'll hand it over to my fellow co-panelists and, and happy to answer any other questions as we go forward.
Joey, thank you so much for those remarks. Um, some stunning statistics there, you know, o- over 2000 fossil fuel lobbyists alone. That's, w- 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 we'll have to talk more about that. Thank you so much for those remarks. Uh, uh, S- Sanji, we very much look forward to hearing from you too. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. I want to thank the Quincy Institute uh, for making this possible. And to my colleagues here, these are really big questions about, you know, I, I don't think I'm being melodramatic when I say that the fate of our species when it comes to the climate uh, and the challenges that we face. You know, Joey did a, a, an amazing job of, of talking about some of the real challenges uh, faced by people who want to speak up from within UAE society, uh, as well as the challenges at COP28 itself. I want to highlight some of the other really painful realities that the UAE is um, masking by taking uh you know, taking the helm in events like COP28 or last year, the year before's uh, Dubai World Expo, et cetera, where they use these events to hide um, incredible, uh, incredible brutality, both inside the country, but then also outside the country as well when it comes to their conduct. And so the the three areas I want to talk about uh, briefly and then uh, pass the mic along are uh, the abuse of worker rights and how that's directly implicated in COP28. Um, the the use of COP28 and other events like this to, to greenwash the human rights violations of individual ruling elites in the UAE. And then finally, how the UAE works over time to export its model of repressive dictatorship across the region, which then blocks other societies from solving their own problems democratically, including the, the problem of climate. So to start with, and just to, just to give folks a sense of uh, just how bad this, these human rights problems are, the very site of the COP28 uh, climate negotiations was built with forced labor. And what I mean with, by that is that the, the organization Equidem, an, an amazing uh, human rights and labor rights and research organization that's a partner of many of our During the construction of what was called uh, Expo City Dubai or Dubai Expo City, which was the site of the uh, 2020 Dubai World Expo, that Expo Dubai, that Dubai Expo City uh, is the site of the COP28 facilities. It's where everyone is meeting right now. And uh, the organization Equidem did an excellent job of documenting how uh, the construction conditions involved significant, uh, significant uh, forced labor, you know, workers from around the world, which make up the majority, the vast majority of UAE society, you know, oftentimes they, they may have had their passports taken away, they were unpaid or underpaid, uh, they don't have, they don't have any sort of independent recourse, independent unions are banned in the UAE, so there's no way for workers to organize or advocate for themselves. And the net result of all of that is that the very site where the COP28 negotiations are being held was built through the sweat and potentially blood of uh, a large number of workers from around the world, particularly the global south, where people leave their homes, leave their communities, leave their uh, their neighborhoods to come to places like the UAE because they are desperate to earn money. And from that position of desperation, they get abused by the UAE and other Gulf monarchies uh, as they do the work of building uh, facilities like the facilities where COP28 is held. So that's one one important example. And it's one of a number of examples that over 200 human rights organizations and and labor and climate organizations came together to highlight in a letter that we participated in that sent a strong signal to governments around the world and the UAE that this business as usual has to end. Uh, Another aspect of the way in which COP28 is being used to greenwash some pretty ugly human rights violations and abuses uh, is in the context of the conduct of the individual ruling elites. So first we have the the direct host of the COP28 negotiations, the ruler of Dubai, uh, Al Maktoum, who a British court found was, uh, you know, found had kidnapped his adult daughters. You know, this has been widely documented, including by Human Rights Watch. Uh, kidnapped his adult daughters uh, when they tried to escape his grip to live lives of independence. Uh, and uh, had engaged in significant spousal abuse, which led to uh, a huge, a huge judgment for his ex-wife. And that's one example of how you know these ruling elites are able to, on the one hand, do whatever they want to whoever they want, 
uh, under their control while simultaneously basking in the international spotlight of, of these types of events and casting themselves falsely as agents of, of uh, quote unquote modernity. Um, another example is the, the so-called minister of tolerance, uh, Sheikh Nahyan, who has been accused of rape by uh, British national Caitlin McNamara. Um, you know, he has been able to continue in his role as the so-called minister of tolerance uh, without any investigation by the UAE monarchy of uh, the crime he's accused of. He even gave opening remarks at a conference in the UAE on women's issues, which just kind of shows the, the depth of the, the you know, fill in the first half of the word, the washing, greenwashing, uh, gender washing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then lastly, I, I want to just highlight that these human rights violations and abuses aren't even limited to the UAE's, the, the, the people who live within the UAE and work within the UAE. A, a, a wide range of countries and societies and governments have been negatively impacted by the UAE's ongoing uh, diplomatic and financial and military interventions against human rights and against democracy across the greater Middle East and North Africa. You can go back to the Arab Spring when Bahrainis came out into the streets to protest for freedom, the UAE and Saudi Arabia rolled their tanks in to shut that down. You know, in Yemen, the UAE has been part of uh, the Saudi-led coalition, which brought uh, horrifying levels of atrocities uh, and, and death as their planes bombed civilians across the uh, across Yemen, sometimes using U.S. weapons, U.S. bombs, uh, U.S. supplied arms. Egypt, another example. In Sudan, the UAE is supporting the has supported the RSF paramilitary group, which has committed a, a large number of atrocities. Libya, they're backing the warlord. They've backed the warlord Haftar. And in Tunisia, they've you know given a lot of diplomatic support and, and perhaps other forms of support as well to the, the ruling autocrat there. And so I just want to close with this, that it, it is, it's a, a terrible situation for people inside the UAE and for people who come to the UAE to work. It's also terrible for people across the, the broader Middle East and North Africa because these issues of climate and democracy are, are, are deeply entwined. People need the freedom to advocate for a better future. And when you have a, an autocratic monarchy or dictatorship like the UAE that is simultaneously you know, uh, undermining climate talks with their greenwashing agenda, while simultaneously undermining democracy across the greater region, it means, and, and, and this is no exaggeration, it means that hundreds of millions of people uh, are negatively impacted and blocked from being able to solve their own problems, including the, the fundamental problem of, of whether or not our species is going to navigate this climate crisis successfully. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. I, I, I think that's such an important point for folks to understand is that these issues are not isolated to, to these countries. They're the, the uh, repression is exported, the greenwashing, the sports washing, you know, what, as you said, the fill in the blank washing is all exported and uh, it, it, it can affect hundreds of millions of people. Th thank you so much, Sanji, for that. Next, uh, last but certainly not least, we're going to turn to Sarah Lee Whitson. Sarah has warned us uh, that, that she is a bit under the weather and yet she is still here because this issue is so important. So doubly thank you for being with us today, Sarah. The, the floor is yours. Um, uh, thanks, Ben. And I want to uh, take special note of the work that you in particular have been doing, um, uh, not just at the Quincy Institute, but before focusing our attention on the corrupting influence of foreign money in the U.S. political system. Um, and, you know, overall, I, I think the observations and comments that I want to make <clears throat> uh, pertain to my discomfort with focusing on the words greenwashing and sports washing because um, I think they really minimize what is at stake and what is happening, uh, not just in COP28, but more broadly. Um, and I think that uh, the dangers uh, of uh, the approach that the UAE and Saudi Arabia uh, are pursuing, um, uh, given their extreme wealth, which uh, uh, in terms of their revenues, in terms of their disposable assets and their public investment funds, in terms of the per capita income, um, uh, really put them ahead of uh, many European states, even the United States, on a number of barometers. Um, and that danger is not just 
uh, about uh, hiding or sports washing or covering up their own abuses uh, against uh, 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 citizens uh, of their own countries or um, uh, the people of Yemen, for example, um, but I think goes much, much more deeply into corrupting and undermining um, uh, uh, international laws uh, and uh, uh, independent voices around the world. Um, with COP28, I think certainly this is a process that's been underway, but what I find most troubling uh, is the way in which we see how uh, uh, the UAE and other petrodollar states have really just cut the bottom out of what COP28 was supposed to be about, um, what the Paris Agreement was supposed to be about, and that is reducing emissions uh, by reducing extraction. That has been taken completely off the table, and the way they've managed to do that, the way the UAE has managed to do that, in addition to uh, basically not allowing any conversation about reducing extraction to actually happen in a serious way at COP28. <coughs> but, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, by using their resources to turn this into something that they can buy off. So they can buy off uh, 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 countries in the global South that have been most harmed and most impacted by climate change uh, by creating this uh, uh, fund, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what its final name is, but the fund basically to compensate states that have suffered these climate damages. Um, and it really is very similar uh, to the United States uh, 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 selling weapons to Saudi and the UAE, uh, and then you know making up for it by sending some pittance of humanitarian aid to Yemen, uh, and of course similarly now in Gaza. So let's distract from the main problem. Let's distract from the issue, which is extraction and emissions, uh, and use our resources to basically uh, secure the silence, compliance uh, of the international community, particularly the countries in the global south that are most damaged. That is the same pattern that we're seeing in terms of the so-called sports washing, arts washing, fashion washing, uh, celebrity washing, you name it, that is underway. Uh, and I think, you know, sort of... Uh, uh, highlighted or, or, or really uh, exemplified by the Saudi government's uh, recent efforts, which are still underway, to acquire uh, American golfing as we know it through PGA Tours. Um, and, you know, first of all, importantly, it's important uh, to know that uh, the UAE and the Saudi are not the first to exploit the openness of Western economic systems, the freedom in Western economic systems that allow for an ownership. Um, uh, they have merely followed the playbook um, that Western governments have been using to buy, control, and influence uh, uh, governments around the world. Um, I think the difference now is in this multipolar reality and multipolar most significantly by measure of resources, resources that allow you to buy military power, resources that allow you to buy not just weapons, but mercenary forces uh, to maintain and, and use those weapons when called upon to do so as the Biden administration did uh, just a year and a half ago in deploying Patriot missiles uh, against Yemen from the UAE. Um, uh, so using uh, uh, their resources in this new multipolar reality to buy influence and uh, as much control as they can muster in open uh, democratic systems like the United States. And so the danger, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> the danger I see in uh, uh, something like the acquisition of PGA tours, which you know is a tip of the iceberg in terms of Saudi and Emirati uh, efforts to buy significant chunks of the American economy. Um, number one is that it's not just about whitewashing or, or you know hiding their own abuses, um, but rather in buying control and influence over sectors of. Uh, the uh, uh, American society where criticism of their abuses has come. 
Um, and, you know, you'll note, and I and I believe this came up in the Senate hearing, that there is a non-disparagement clause in PGA Tours deal uh, with the Public Investment Fund uh, uh, not to allow uh, those persons associated with PGA Tours, which of course includes the players, to criticize Saudi Arabia, which they were amply doing uh, when uh, uh, the Public Investment Fund and LIV Golf was their rival in particular, talking about the Saudi human rights abuses. Um, and, you know, complementary to that is um, the acquisition of a, a, a political influence via the purchase of American politicians and military officials. Uh, frankly, I think that is the most terrifying prospect, the most terrifying reality. When Saudi Arabia and the UAE can buy over 500 American former military officials and have them on the payroll, when it can hire the former head of the National Security Council of the United States and the Trump administration, when it can use its business acquisitions like LIV Gulf, uh, to funnel money to political candidates like the payments that Donald Trump's uh, 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 golf uh, uh, courts, uh, I don't know what they're called, golf locations, have received from LIV Golf, which is entirely owned by Saudi Arabia. For me, that looks like a money washing, a money laundering operation to funnel foreign money to American political candidates uh, and to corrupt the American government and the decision making of American government officials who are counting their future paychecks uh, that are you know, uh, impossible uh, to earn in the United States, even were they to work as defense industry lobbyists. The eye-popping salaries that even junior level uh, 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 military staffers can earn from the UAE means that their decision making when they're in government becomes tainted by conflicts of interest. Um, and that's why, uh, in addition to demanding that American companies uh, British companies, Western companies comply with their own human rights responsibilities under the UN guiding principles to do their due diligence before they accept investments from companies like the Saudi Public Investment Fund, which itself has been implicated in torture and abuse, uh, including the torture uh, 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 and murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Um, uh, as well as the family members of, uh, of Saad al-Jabri, uh, from whom they confiscated the very planes they used to transport the hit team that killed Jamal. Um, we more fundamentally, more essentially uh, need legislation that will prohibit U.S. government and military officials from working for foreign governments, doing business with foreign governments. So that would capture the $2 billion that Jared Kushner received from the Public Investment Fund. Um, in the same way that we currently do not do not allow American intelligence officials uh, to work for foreign governments or do business with foreign governments when they leave office. And it's shocking to me that this legislation, though we have important political leaders like Senator Warren pursuing it and promising to pursue it, has not yet been implemented because it is a very serious national security threat. Uh, it's sort of almost funny when I have raised this with uh, 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 government officials, senators, the senator for Pennsylvania, not Fetterman, but the other guy, blanking on his name, the justification for allowing U.S. military <coughs> and government officials to work for uh, 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 the uh, dictatorships in the Gulf is the notion that this is how the U.S. maintains influence and an ongoing acquisition spree of U.S. weapons. And so, in fact, it's in U.S. interest to have American officials infiltrate the highest echelons of power there. Um, uh, it's a fantastic view. And if we look at the outcomes, if we look at how decisions are being made, uh, it is not uh, uh, the UAE and Saudi Arabia making decisions in America's interest. It is very much uh, 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 the United States, the U.S. government making decisions in their interests to the harm of American citizens, the safety and security of American citizens, but more fundamentally, the integrity of our democracy, the integrity of the freedom of our economic systems and our uh, citizens. So I'll pause there and mute. Uh... Thank you so much, Sarah. I, I, I... 
I think your your point cannot be stated heavily enough that it, it, it's so critical for us to understand that sports washing, green light, you know, uh, the fill in the blank washing. These are all part of much larger influence operations. And it's very important that we not think of these in their own individual silos. Exactly like you said. I think that's right. Um, now, folks, we're going to turn to the Q&A session. And, you know, I see we've already got some uh, questions in the Q&A. That's wonderful. Other folks, please feel free to add those. Uh, I, as the moderator, I'm going to do what all moderators do. And I'm going to take the first couple questions and then, then, then we'll get to that Q&A. Um, my first question is for Joey. I, I, I know, Joey, that you, you have lived, uh, worked, or, or visited, in, and I believe every single country we've mentioned here, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm very curious about the view on the ground in these, uh, in, in these countries, not how the, the governments view these sports washing and green washing operations, but how the citizens of those countries view them. And from, from what you've seen, do the citizens there, do they recognize what these governments are doing? Um, if so, do they do they approve of it? Are they critical of it? What, what's been your experience? Thanks, Ben. That's a very interesting um, and important question. I mean, I think uh, it's also very complicated and there's no, you know, one response from from folks who who you speak with. I think um, the, the response is, is different a bit on some sports washing efforts versus greenwashing, um, you know, on, on sports washing, especially domestically, you know, um, uh, for example, Ronaldo coming to Saudi Arabia, of course, Saudi citizens are going to be in support of this. Um, even, you know, entertainment and, and cultural events coming to Saudi Arabia, of course, um, you know, folks want to participate in these these events um, and they have every right to. I, I think what is of concern is, you know, Saudi citizens, um, folks across the Gulf should be able to enjoy these high profile sports and entertainment events um, while as well having their basic rights rights and freedoms protected. And one should not be at the expense of the other. And that is what we have been seeing over the course of many years um, you know, at Human Rights Watch uh, in our work on, on Saudi and the UAE. In terms of greenwashing, I think the picture is, is a bit more complicated. Um, I'll speak particularly about the UAE because we're, we're here at the moment. Um, I think that the, you know, greenwashing is, is is very, very effective um, and sort of un unseen by many citizens, just given the complete uh, lack of independent civil society, given that there are no independent civil society groups, no independent environmental groups who are able to independently scrutinize the Emirati government's environmental record, its uh, climate change pledges, as well as the very um, harmful health impacts from the protect production of fossil fuels. This knowledge is simply just not out there for people to consider um, and, you know, to engage with in terms of, you know, what is being greenwashed and what is not being greenwashed. For example, over the course of the research that I mentioned previously about air pollution in the UAE, it was incredibly difficult for us to do this research because there are so few groups, um, zero, who are able to independently, you know, engage um, and do this sort of environmental activism um, and environmental research. Uh, and so, of course, we used um, we used government data um, to get an understanding of the, you know, air pollution. Um, but there's like a, a very big knowledge gap in terms of our understanding of what these, you know, harms are um, of fossil fuels in countries like the UAE because the suppression has been so total. So I think in terms of um, greenwashing, the, the picture is a little bit, you know, more mixed um, just because there there isn't this knowledge, you know, available that really links um, the, the harms from fossil fuels um, to, to health risks and, and other um, human rights violations. Um, so the greenwashing is is less apparent um, to, to folks on the ground, specifically um, in regard to the energy transition and, and, you know, the need to rapidly phase out fossil fuels and the link with, with health harms. Yeah, that's such a good point. I think, it, 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 I don't know if we can possibly overstate just how risky it, it, it is to do the kind of research that, that your organization has done in the UAE. UAE has a history 
of, of, of not just uh, censoring that research, but actively suppressing and even detaining researchers operating in the UAE. One of the more high profile examples being Matt Hedges, a, uh, an, a, a UK uh, um, scholar who was doing research for a PhD dissertation, uh, who found himself in solitary confinement for, for months on end because just because he was doing research in the UAE. Yeah, and I, I think it's you know interesting on, on this panel here today. So this is um, last week was the first time in a decade that Human Rights Watch was able to get access to the UAE. Um, the last time I believe was in 2013. And perhaps um, uh, Sarah um, can speak about the last time HRW had attempted to, to enter the country. <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I'll let you step in there if you'd like to. But yeah, so that that sort of speaks to you know how challenging this work is and um, um, and what you know the 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 narratives and the information that fills the gap um, of you know uh, from what is like not there and when the research can't be done. Sarah, any comments on yeah, that? Yeah, no, I would just say um, I guess the UAE is one of the countries that I've been deported from. Um, I was uh, on my way to Yemen from Libya and basically in transit for a few days in the UAE and. <laughs> they wouldn't let me in. And it really was not because of the work we had done on migrant workers in the UAE, which we started in 2014. Um, uh, I'm sorry, in 2005. Um, wow. Uh, but was because of the work we had done uh, for uh, the protection of dissidents in the country. And, and dissident is too much of a word for people who had written letters gently, kindly asking their dear emir to uh, uh, recognize and allow them to have some mode of participation in, in their government, uh, including my dear friend Ahmed Mansoul, who remains in prison. That was the sort of red line for them that led to my expulsion, um, along with some Yemenis who were being deported to uh, Yemen. Uh, there was this uh, funny waiting room at the airport that was filled with these, you know, very impoverished Yemenis uh, and me um, uh, waiting for our deportation. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember whether we had, uh, we tried to send people there afterwards. Uh, I don't think we were able to get anyone in. Um, Joey will um, remember, but um uh, it had clearly as well a knock-on effect with other Gulf states. Bahrain uh, banned us uh, as well. And I don't think we were able to get into Saudi Arabia too much after that. I think I went to Saudi Arabia once after that. Um, but that is um, one of the problems in this kind of uh, shared uh, uh, security uh, information. The good news is that Kuwait doesn't pay much attention uh, to that and does chart a bit of an independent line. But Oman, for example, does not. And we have had Omani officials tell us that if the UAE doesn't want us in, that they won't let us in either. Thank you, Sarah and, and, and Joey. Very, very enlightening remarks. Um, uh, so, Sanjeev, I want to turn to you, and uh, I, I, I want to commend your, your organization, Freedom Forward, for for really doing some fascinating advocacy work on these issues. You have brought together a uh, we'll call it a strange bedfellows coalition in some ways, but a very large coalition um, that's very active on on, on highlighting, um, uh, especially on greenwashing, the the, the perils of greenwashing. Um, so my, my, my question is, uh, other than your, your superb convening skills, says we previously worked together, so I've seen you, you, you work for, firsthand, how do you bring these organizations together? Why do you think that there are so many diverse organizations that have come together to, to spotlight the hypocrisy that we're seeing in, in the UAE related to COP28? Thanks, Ben. That's very kind of you. Um, I, I would say first that... Um, any any effort like that depends on you know the the, the dramatic expertise of expert uh, and it's redundant but the expertise of experts uh, and so in the context of the the letter that you're talking about that over 200 organizations signed you know it, it's it's folks like uh, the the team at Don Sarah Leah Whitson's team uh, and, and you know Joey herself who who provided provide a lot of the research and the the documentation and others at Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International that make these uh, 
these kinds of coalition efforts uh, possible. And, and, you know, Ben, I, I'll just say right now that from our prior work together, uh, along with Don, uh, on the question of, you know, uh, lobbyists in Washington representing uh, oil dictators, Saudi Arabia, UAE, et cetera, that, you know, your research and Don's research has, both, has been critical to that as well. So thanks to, to all three of you, uh, folks like me can be, uh, you know, somewhat effective at times. Um, I mean, I think that the, the basic reality is that that we're, we all are recognizing that these questions all intersect. You know, do workers have the freedom to organize? Do people have the freedom to speak out? Uh, are our societies and governments going to be able to face the hard realities of the climate crisis? Th those issues cannot be separated from each other. And, and a society or a, a, a country that where a government is cracking down on people's abilities to speak to organize is also likely to be a place where when people disagree with what the government's doing, uh, and in this case, we're talking about global civil society inside COP28, inside the UAE, that there's the risk of repression. And so that's why so many organizations around the world, you know, 200 plus came together in this multi-issue letter that I believe viewers can watch, can can click the link on right now in the in the comments. Uh, and it's, it speaks to, I think, the direction uh, a lot of us need to be moving in, which is to bring together uh, a wide range of, of people and communities and organizations that may all have sort of officially different focus areas, whether it's climate or union organizing or labor or freedom of speech or getting prisoners out of prison, or in some cases have very integrated approaches like our, our colleagues at Amnesty International Human Rights Watch. Um, and then to, to to marshal that power to to organize the possibility of a new reality, uh, because ultimately the UAE monarchy and others repressive governments like it are going to continue to do what they do uh, until they feel sufficient pressure to to pursue an alternative. And it's incumbent on all of us to to sort of build that pressure and make that possible. Can you explore that before I, we have some good questions in the Q&A that I want to get to, but one last moderate, moderator's prerogative question. Can we, can we explore that a little bit? And I, I would like each of you to, if you could, just offer one thing about what we can do about this. I think we we spent the last 45 minutes scaring the heck out of our viewers, um, scaring me too. And I know I know a lot of this already, uh, but you've all done a wonderful job of, uh, of pointing out the perils of, uh, of these issues. Sarah, in her remarks, pointed to some some legislative fixes that that, that we can use to resolve this. Um, you, you know, for each of you, if, if there was one thing you had to say that that we could do, you, you know, a proactive step that can be taken to address some of these issues, uh, what, what what do you think that is? Um, Maybe I think the single most important thing and one of Don's top priorities is uh, to secure a, a bill. Um, that limits the ability of U.S. government and military officials uh, to work or do business with foreign governments, um, really just copy pasting the existing law that Adam Schiff initially drafted and is now the law of the lands uh, signed by uh, the Biden, uh, by President Biden, that restricts intelligence officials for 36 months uh, after they leave their work uh, um, from doing this. Um, but more broadly, uh, in terms of the foreign policy community, um, uh, and this is my recommendation to Human Rights Watch, as well as Amnesty and other big organizations that have far more resources than uh, any of our three little shops, um, is to stop opting out of these political discussions, stop opting out of this legislative work that is essential and vital to the success of the millions and millions of dollars we spend to do the research, to document the facts, including the incredible report about uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, murder of hundreds of migrants uh, at the Yemeni border. Um, my view and my belief is that all of the facts and evidence that organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty have been putting forward about abuses for decades um, that specifically involve US complicity because of weapon sales and military assistance. They fall on deaf ears. They do not result in any serious change in US government policy. And that is because our government officials are captive and conflicted. And so I do not believe that organizations can opt out of this work 
if they want um, the work they do in documentation uh, and advocacy to make a difference. And if we look around us, if we look around just the Middle East, we look at decades of work, um, most prominently, sadly, uh, Israel-Palestine, decades of work documenting and exposing these abuses with no positive result and outcome. In fact, everything is worse and everything the US government is doing to aid and abet these governments is worse. So uh, my recommendation uh, to uh, our community is that we must participate proactively in these so-called political discussions. And we can't sort of opt out and from an ivory tower merely act as reporting agents with this, I think, outdated belief that with enough facts, enough, enough information, enough sunlight, uh, 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 the positive recommendations that we're making will follow. They won't. Um, because our government officials are captive and we need to address that. Thank you, Sarah. Sanjeev, Joey, what, what preferred solutions? Uh, I'll jump in with a couple. I mean, I think that when you're dealing with the sort of many tentacled, you know, uh, octopus of a, a government that's, you know, exporting repression and engaging in repression at home, that also means that from a campaigner's perspective or from an advocate's perspective, there are many targets and opportunities. So for those of us in the United States, uh, if you do a little digging, you'll find that NYU has a deal with the UAE monarchy and a campus there. And there's an interview where uh, the head of NYU uh, is asked, will you release the contract? Will you make that public? And he said flat out no. So, you know, NYU has a, a, a private secret deal with the UAE monarchy. Another even, I think, even more problematic example, you should Google Smithsonian UAE, and you'll find that the Smithsonian has a deal with the UAE. And the UAE gets, you know, these like you know, softball sort of exhibits and promotion. They even had at the, at the Washington, D.C. Folk Life Festival some kind of a, an exhibit uh, talking about their efforts on climate mitigation, which is before COP28. And so we ought to ask the question, why is the Smithsonian in a relationship with a, a foreign repressive petrostate? And we ought to ask for the details of that deal, that relationship. And so what I'm saying is that even though these are very big issues, right, democracy, climate, a, a repressive monarchy slash dictatorship, they also have very specific targets of opportunity because they are constantly overexposing themselves politically by constantly trying to wash away uh, the, the realities of, of what they're doing and how they're behaving. I couldn't agree more, Sanjeev, and I'll, I'll only add to that that my, my alma mater, actually, Texas A&M, has been in a, a years-long legal battle to keep its contracts with the, the government of Qatar secret uh, as well. Uh, Joey, last but certainly not least, how, how are we gonna fix all this? Absolutely. So there have been a lot of big picture um, uh, suggestions. I want to get into the sort of specifics of the climate negotiations, because however um, removed they may seem from us, they are hugely consequential for achieving <clears throat> ambitious action on climate change. And what is all the more disturbing about the UAE's greenwashing efforts this year is that um, this year they are climate activists are um, engaging in a concerted effort to get a specific reference to fossil fuels in the concluding document of COP28. Um, and this should not be a year that, you know, uh, this conference is being held in a repressive petro state. So what can we do about it? Um, Human Rights Watch has been calling for the host agreement between the UNFCCC and the COP28 presidency to be made public. It has not been made public so far. We do not know what, if any, rights guarantees the UNFCCC demanded from um, the COP28 presidency and the Emirati government. Um, we also are pushing for um, rights guarantees and, and human rights language to be included in, um, you know, future COP host agreements because, you know, there, <clears throat> there absolutely needs to be space for civil society at these negotiations. Civil society um, pushes these conversations forward. Um, environmental groups are, you know, absolutely essential for achieving this ambitious action and they need to be here on the ground and they need to be able to raise their voices loudly and that has just not been the case this year so those two very um unfccc specific recommendations is is what i would suggest for combating greenwashing 
Thank you so much. I, I, all three of you, you've, you've given us some hope. So, th so thank you. Um, now, I, I, I very much, we're, we're a little low on time, but I, I would like to get to some of the Q&A from our audience here. And we, we have an important question from Frank Lampson here, and I'm going to uh, paraphrase Frank's uh, uh, comment. But he, he makes the point that a lot of the sports that we have here in the U.S., uh, they're billionaire dominated, even our, our, our college sports up until very recently. Our, our scholar athletes were unpaid athletes in a, a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, and our other major sports, the NBA, which, uh, which I had mentioned previously, and we have some foreign ownership in other sports, PGA Tour, now with Saudi Arabia most notably. So Frank's effectively asking that th these sports have always been dominated by uh, by a domestic billionaire class. It is what we're seeing now those sports an attempt by foreign uh, billionaires and these th these sovereign wealth funds to to replace those th domestic billionaires? It, 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 is that what you're seeing, or, 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 or is there something more here? Uh, I mean, yes, absolutely. And the difference is that the uh, 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 domestic billionaires are still subject uh, to the laws of the land, uh, to a country that is ruled by law and not by dictatorship, um, and where we have constitutional protections for our rights. So the billionaires can own the clubs and they can certainly exert pressure, but ultimately the players, the teams are free. Uh, and if they're injured, they have courts to go to where their rights can be defended. Um, this is not the case when you're dealing with these foreign government owned uh, uh, investment funds. Right. And this was an issue that actually, to, to step out of my moderator's role, um, uh, that, that, that Joey and I uh, addressed when we testified before the Senate. And a big reason that the, the Senate is investigating this merger between PGA and LIV um, is that the LIV tour and the Saudi government has been very unwilling to, to, to be transparent, to disclose the documents that the Senate is asking for. They've even subpoenaed them now. Um, and so the Senate has ha had to go to extraordinary lengths to get basic information that that a U.S. investor or a U.S. firm would have had to provide voluntarily. Um, there, next, we have. Can I just question. intervene with a question on that? What has been the response of uh, uh, the public investment fund to that subpoena? I don't believe we know that. Jo jo Joey, do you have any insight? Yeah, I was just going to jump in. The last that I I checked um, on what is publicly available from the committee is that there hasn't been a response. Um, there hasn't been an update from the committee. Um, and this was the U.S., as you said, U.S.-based subsidiary of the PIF, which is, you know, um, a sort of smaller, smaller fish uh, than the, you know, Saudi-based PIF. And even that has not yet, you know, there hasn't been an update. But, but very quickly, and it'll be the last question here. Uh, B.J. Brown uh, asked a question about... Uh, how uh, this is sort of to the exporting of, of repression. And, and, and BJ points out that the U.S. supported dictators directly in the past. And he, he's asking if, if what we're now saying is that we support wealthy, suppressive leaders who then go on to, to spread that repression to other countries w without the U.S. doing it. Is that, a, is that an effective paraphrase? So, 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 Sanjeev, I, I believe you brought this up. Uh, I mean, it's a good question. I, I don't, I think fundamentally things haven't really changed, you know, and that, and that large segments of humanity are considered collateral damage in the, the great power plays of, of powerful governments, including the United States. And so the United States wants to maintain some kind of hegemonic power in the Middle East uh, in a world where that's it's the power is less direct. And what that means is, is being close to the UAE monarchy, even as the UAE monarchy brings suffering and misery to millions of people across the greater Middle East, as I you know, mentioned in terms of all the countries where it's intervened. Uh, and, and that's the ugly reality. And, and we're seeing that now with the Biden administration doubling down on its support for Israel amidst the, you know, what I, I consider to be genocidal attacks in Gaza and, and the Abraham Accords, where the Biden administration picked up the Trump baton and is attempting to stitch together all of the repressive governments that are U.S. backed uh, into one alliance of dictators and apartheid. Uh, so that's that is the ugly reality of, of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. It's it is a fundamental obstacle to both democracy and addressing the climate crisis. Right. With that, we we have just a minute left. So uh, uh, final comments from from each of our panelists, if you if you got me anything we've left out that you'd like our audience to know. 
The the last comment, and I did say it earlier, but um, uh, I think it's you know just important to say again the case Ahmed Mansour that that Sarah mentioned um, as well. You know this was HRW's top priority coming into COP is demanding his immediate and unconditional release. As I said at the beginning, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that we have seen crickets from the international community very few, if any, public statements bilaterally from governments demanding his release. And this is because um, the UAE's efforts at greenwashing, whitewashing, whatever kind of washing have been so effective. There's a lot of money on the table, but with that comes a lot of vulnerability for those who are trying to spend it and those who are willing to take it. And that means that we all have a lot of opportunities to hold these repressive governments and, uh, the recipients of their largesse uh, accountable. Sarah, any final thoughts? Okay. Well, with, with that, then I I I, I just want to thank all of our panelists so much uh, for 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 this for, for, for attending today and just for your wonderful work. For our viewers, thank you all for watching, and I highly encourage you to follow each of our panelists. Their organizations are doing wonderful work on this topic and in, in, in many more. So, so stay in touch with them, please. And thank you all for your work today. And, and thanks to everyone for watching. Have a great day.